Welcome back. Today, we're reacting to Alexander Bromley's take on exercise science and why it's killing your gains. Now, as a sports scientist, Dr. Milo Wolf, I would like to react to this video because I think I'm someone who has some experience actually conducting research and I have read plenty of studies and therefore I should be able to provide some useful and insightful responses to some of the critiques that Alexander Bromley is making. I haven't watched this video before. I'll be reacting to it completely unprompted. All I've heard is that it contains some hot takes regarding sports science and I wanted to react to it. So let's dig into it. Applying physics, chemistry, engineering to the real world requires certainty. If you have the incorrect model, it gets you exposed quickly and in a big way. It's a company failing to invent the next billion dollar tech product or faulty architecture costing- This is very dramatic. So these sciences only thrive when everyone is stress testing these ideas, applying skepticism and double checking each other's work with the utmost precision. But it's important to note, all academic disciplines are not created equal. The further you are from the fundamental pieces of reality, the more complexity you have to contend with and the more muddy- I mean, he's not wrong so far, but I think that it would be remiss to compare a, an applied physiological science, like sports science, to something like theoretical physics. Social sciences don't have a method for tracking the efficacy of their models, they don't tend to reward skepticism, and they base many of their assumptions on weak evidence or outdated models, like the blank slate theory. Now, these academic departments oh man, shitting on sociology, psychology and the like is not a good look. Uh, it just betrays that you have a certain bias, usually a pro-quantitative bias. You have people who do many isolation movements over many repeating sets, and you have those that do barbell only work. You have those who Indeed, there are a variety of approaches and all of them are reasonably effective. They may only be different by a few percentage points and thus in practice, because there are many more important factors, you're not necessarily going to see that person X following X approach is getting more jacked than person Y following Y approach because their approach isn't really even what's dictating the results as much as nutrition or sleep or stress or genetics or PD use. So for sure. Now the scientific literature has settled on a few staple recommendations that seem to hold all of these different tribes under its umbrella. Hell yeah, that's this is correct. I mean for hypertrophy anyways, I'm assuming this is for hypertrophy, but uh, not three, no. No, not three reps. That's likely outside of the maximally effective rep range continuum for hypertrophy. And 30 is likely on the lower end as well. In fact, we have a study by Brad Schoenfeld comparing seven sets of three to three sets of 10, and seven sets of three resulted in the same hypertrophy, except they spent about three times the time in the gym. So on a set per set basis, doing a set of three is not nearly as effective as doing a set of 10. Otherwise you would see like two and a half times as much hypertrophy. So clearly three reps isn't enough to maximize hypertrophy as evidenced within the study. Number two, the importance of effort. Five is often repeated as the magic amount of reps in reserve. The basic idea is that if you are within five sets of momentary muscular failure, the conditions for hypertrophy seem to be better than if you are outside of it. And that coincides with- Fair enough. I mean, you will probably see more hypertrophy as you go closer to failure, but five reps in reserve will still give you a training effect before the effectiveness drops off with the caveat that rest periods are sufficiently long enough and this also fits a wide variety of training approaches as some of the bodybuilders who do many sets in a workout like jay cutler often use very short rest periods and didn't rest very long number four dose relationship of volume per week now this is one of the most widely cited bits of information in exercise science as there have been a shout out brad schoenfeld for this meta-analysis Tending to result in more growth doesn't actually mean anything here. Either on average it does or it doesn't. These are all very big ranges. Like certainly a big chunk of trainees are doing something between three and 30 reps with high effort between 10 and 20 sets per week. They don't all just see permanent growth without stopping. They all no one ever claimed it was gonna give you permanent growth. That's a common misconception. It's like, yeah, you might find a better training approach through science but it's not claiming to give you infinite gains. No one ever made that claim, hopefully. The inability of research to answer these questions conclusively is really just the tip of the iceberg. It turns out that there are a lot more problems than just overly vague. Range. They're not overly vague. It just means that a variety of approaches are reasonably similarly effective. Science studies often struggle to find a sample of people who are representative of the typical trainee. No. Many studies use untrained subjects who are notoriously sensitive to any growth stimulus. For someone who has never lifted weights, cardio actually- That is true. And on the other hand, 
there is a massive dearth of accomplished lifters represented in research with almost no studies. That is true as well. Fraud, if I said to you, Fraud, I have this great study. Shut up, Brian Schoenfeld. What a beautiful man. This is true as well. This is part of the reason why it's so difficult to get advanced trainees in your studies. The guy who is currently out of shape, who used to bench 315 back in the day, but can barely do 10 push ups right now, you will slingshot closer to those old numbers with just about. Oh, man. And whatever group you were in is going to look good as a result. Now, all groups in a study tend to have high and low performers represented. So I'm not sure what his point here is. Is his point that the people signing up for studies all see artificially high results because they're usually coming from a layoff? If so, that's very, very untrue. I think a lot of participants, as he mentioned earlier, are just beginners or relatively untrained people. And sure, there are gonna be cases where the results that you find in less trained people do not generalize to more trained populations. However, there are a lot of reasons why researchers use untrained participants. One, they're a lot easier to recruit. As he mentions in the video, getting untrained participants who don't have an attachment to training a certain way or to optimizing their results is a lot easier than getting someone who's been training for 10 years and wants to add a tiny bit of muscle for their next competitive season in bodybuilding. So you can get more people that way. And guess what? If you get more people in a bigger sample, that allows you to have more power in your analyses, or essentially be able to determine with greater accuracy how big an effect is, for example, of using length and partials versus a full range of motion. By having more people in your study, by recruiting untrained participants who are more willing to take part, we're able to have greater precision in our estimate of how big the effect really is. Reason number two, because these participants are untrained, you usually see higher effect sizes, or essentially you see changes or effects more readily which again, allows you to have a greater precision or power in your analysis. Finally, and much to the dismay of our whole niche of very, very advanced trainees, I'm sure most of the people watching this video have been training for two or three years at least, most people who are in the gym haven't been training for that long. A lot of people lift for like a year and then stop lifting. I know that's not me, that's probably not you, but a lot of people are that way. And so when it comes to actually Producing results that will apply to most people in the gym seeking to get results, studying people who've been training for six months or 12 months or what have you, is gonna be a lot more relevant to most people than studying people who've been lifting for 10 years. And plus, again, add on to that, that those people aren't gonna be willing to participate in research in the first place. The conclusions that get summarized as this protocol was better than that are simply an average of the people in the study. I'll give the same That's correct. program. We work in averages. Of... Before we go on, I just want to clarify that when a research group typically claims that this intervention, for example, length and partials, was better than this intervention, for example, for range of motion, they don't claim this merely on account of differences in the average gain between groups. They also claim this on account of how much of a difference was there between participants in their improvements in each group. For example, if in the length and partials group, on average, there was a 10% increase in muscle size, but there were people who lost half their muscle size and people who quadrupled their muscle size, so there's a huge spread of responses, versus in the full range of motion group, responses were more homogenous or more consistently the same between participants. That also plays into whether or not one group was significantly better than the other. In terms of statistical significance, variance, or how much of a difference there is between participants in their responses, does get incorporated. So it's unfair or uncharitable to say that we only look at averages, because when we claim this intervention was better than this one, we do also take into account variance, or different responses to a given intervention. Okay, okay, so individual predictions are hard to do. So let's say we're going to forego those predictions for individuals and lower our standards to just finding what tends to be best for a population of diverse individuals. Just to interject, assuming that there is a huge amount of individual response to given intervention, it needs to actually be analyzed first. With any biological phenomenon, pretty much, there is going to be some variance. Some people are going to respond differently than others, right? Some people might see a better training effect or a worse training effect. However, whether or not a specific intervention results in more variance than others is the topic of ongoing scientific study. And there has been a call for specific analyses to be performed to look at whether or not there truly is individual response 
when it comes to a specific intervention. So I wouldn't just say, you know, oh, why are we dealing in averages when there's clearly hugely individual responses? For a lot of phenomena, lifting can actually reduce the amount of variance that you see in, for example, muscle growth. So just because you put 100 people who are sedentary and you make them lift weights, most of those people will actually get closer in terms of how their muscle mass changes over time. It's kind of an equalizer rather than something that people have a huge individual response to. What I fear is going to happen here, what Alex Brom is going to say, and this has happened in the past in, for example, medicine, is that, well, exercise science only deals in averages, not in the individual responses. And therefore, when it comes to your training, you, dear viewer of the Wolf Coaching YouTube channel, it doesn't really inform you as to what you should do. And so it's useless. The truth is, in all likelihood, just by virtue of the nature of averages, you are going to be close to the average responder. If you're completely different from the population being studied and the circumstances being studied, yeah, you're probably not gonna be the average. However, for a lot of people, you're not that different from the average person taking part in the study, unless you've been training for 20 years and you're looking at a study where people have been training for six months. However, even when there is a substantial difference between how long you've been training for or your circumstances and the circumstances within the study, just be aware that if you're going to disregard the study, make sure you have a sufficiently compelling rationale to do so. Yes, there are gonna be differences between someone who's more advanced and less advanced. However, a lot of the same fundamental principles do still apply. We actually need in each study to have confidence in our conclusions. A power hey, he's actually touching on power analysis. According to James Krieger in his volume Bible, I would need approximately 100 subjects per group to declare a 5% versus 10% gain in muscle size as statistically significant 80% of the time. True. Most individual studies in sports science are underpowered. There's simply not enough participants in each group to be able to accurately and consistently detect effects that might be there or not be there, right? And so one thing that's happening is meta-analyses are being used to group studies together and have more confidence about the effect we're estimating. With that being said, if you ever wonder, oh, why did this one study not use a power analysis? Or why did they refer to, for example, constraint-based sample size justification? That's probably because in most sports science studies, funding isn't something you just come by. Funding is usually something that is sparse, that you provide yourself, or you have no funding. In the case of my PhD, for example, for some studies, I didn't have any funding. And so it was basically just me working out of my own free will, I guess. And it was essentially limited by how much time could I spend in the lab with participants doing research. In a lot of sports science studies, that's exactly what's happening. You only have a select number of members of research team that can actually contribute. You only have so much funding. And so it's not really a matter of let's get as many participants in as we can because we have all this funding that we can use to get a good amount of power and to be able to accurately detect effects. It's more of a case of, okay, well, we have this much time, we have this many people, let's try and get as many people as we feasibly can and then make cautious inferences and extrapolations based on this one study. Because in this one study, you didn't have 300 people. You might've had 30 to 50 if you're lucky. And so that's where meta-analyses come in. By grouping together multiple studies on the same topic with limited sample sizes in each, you're able to have a much larger sample size and therefore a much more accurate estimate of the effect that you're observing. There wasn't data to evaluate results based on training status, whether they were trained or untrained subjects. It didn't take into account weekly volume, just what was done in a single session and only counted sets per exercise. I feel like he's pointing out the flaws of a specific paper rather than of exercise science. Um, there are plenty of meta-analyses that do subgroup analyses by training status or do moderator analyses looking at weekly volume as a continuous variable. So he's really just citing limitations of one paper here. And it's been often cited ever since. There's a more recent meta-analysis on the topic, so I'm not sure why he's referring to this one. There's a meta-analysis by Baz Val and colleagues. But again, it seems like he's just pointing out potential small flaws of papers rather than a concern with exercise science as a whole. Have the density of data oh shit, it's above me. 10 sets. It's me. Well, here we go. Another ad. I even purchased YouTube Premium to make these videos. You know, after you so successfully funded my YouTube Premium, I am now able to watch these videos during reactions without interruption. So thank you for your support. The conclusions from these studies are often evaluated as if the observed difference is a new rule that can just be plugged into any system to guarantee a better result. That was never the claim. ...behind every observed difference in a study. 
Take for example this Nippert video tackling the question of training to failure. He includes this study by Carroll which shows less hypertrophy coming from the group that trained to failure and includes it into his columns to make a global decision about failure being good or bad for size. Except this study was using athletes in the context of specific athletic training, not specific hypertrophy training. So we have a big issue here. Alex Bromley is essentially making the claim that because these circumstances don't perfectly reflect what we're doing in practice, that the findings do not generalize whatsoever or don't apply whatsoever. And this is kind of an example of what I call colloquially black and white thinking or dichotomous thinking, where either the circumstances, the program in the study, the people being studied, etc., are perfectly relevant to what you're doing and therefore you consider the results, or they're not perfectly relevant and therefore you're like, yep, the study doesn't matter. It's ultimately on a continuum from being highly relevant in the population of interest with a training program that's similar to what you do in practice, measuring things that you actually care about, to a study in animals looking at outcomes you don't care about and on a time scale that you don't care about either. So it's all on a continuum of how likely is it to generalize to you. And I think this black and white thinking, all it really does here is foster an understanding of, ah, eh, science is useless for our purposes. When in reality, even this study here, like doing compound lifting for athletic performance isn't actually that dissimilar from doing hypertrophy training. Yes, the rep range might be different. Yes, you might be training closer or further from failure. But by and large, you're performing resistance training. If there was a big effect of training to failure on adaptations, you would also see it in this study. Is it the most relevant study ever? No, but is it still to be considered within answering the question of how does failure impact things during lifting? Absolutely. It ends up in a simplified chart where failure gets a thumbs up or a thumbs down as if the noise created by different contexts don't wash away all the meaningful conclusions you can make. We have a problem with how popular culture engages with- Noise absolutely plays a role, but nevertheless, that doesn't mean you throw away a study just because there's some noise in it. There is noise in every measurement. Types of differences. While Schoenfeld, Krieger, Helms, and others can pull double duty, telling people the limitations of these- patients Shout out Schoenfeld, shout out Helms, shout out Krieger. But unfortunately... Oh God. Now this is where shade is going to be thrown. Greg Knuckles put it more difficult. The white paper. Would have. A criticism that I do have of not shout not out Greg Knuckles, a great guy. Researchers, researchers in our field um, is relatively poor statistical literacy. Uh, the, I agree with that. The mathier folks, like not the one who did the study, finding that eighty-five percent of exercise science papers had statistical errors in them which Lyle McDonald called directly a shit show. The Ridelli trash. Lyle McDonald is not really an authority on anything hypertrophy related. I'm sorry. Gained more muscle than uh, the low volume weight training and beginners needed like 37 to 45 sets to grow. Uh, it's, it's garbage data. A quick guide to Alex or Lyle, whoever else just wants to throw out a study. Don't like the results? Just call it garbage data and move on and disregard that study for the rest of all time. It's very good, especially when you have other studies broadly finding the same thing. It very much makes sense to just disregard studies because they don't align with your bias neatly. Now there's an obvious disparity in rigor with exercise science compared to other- There really isn't. Most other arenas have similar issues. If you think sports science is unique, try reading some of the psychology data. Try reading some of the data in most other fields. You'll see that most other fields also have methodological concerns. That doesn't mean we throw them out altogether. That doesn't mean that these individuals aren't smart, but it speaks to the global standards held in the field. Now, I'm sorry if that's harsh, but Apparently. there's a ton of cloudiness in the research, yet people still get to their first 400 pound deadlift, and Mr. Olympia winners still weigh 280 pounds on stage. Nobody who is conducting yet another study comparing sets to failure or not with half serious college kids actually believes that anything paradigm shifting is going to come out of it. Come on, dude. Like, sports science was never about being paradigm shifting, or it very rarely is. Most studies are just about shifting the estimate we have of a given effect a little bit closer to what reality is. So we have a little bit more of an accurate estimate of, for example, now, how much more growth failure seems to give you, or how much more fatiguing failure seems to be. These sorts of effects have to be estimated and measured somehow. Each additional study provides us with a bit more accuracy regarding what the effect truly is. And in certain areas, like range of motion, there are only relatively few studies. So while it's not paradigm shifting, and no one is claiming it is, and by the way, very few papers are paradigm shifting in general. This is the case in physics, this is the case in every science you wanna cite, 
most papers just have a small effect, right, on the overall consensus within the field. Sports science was never meant to be just paradigm shifting. And to claim that, oh, well, it's supposed to be paradigm shifting, but studies aren't really doing all that much, that's probably because your interpretation of studies isn't that good. If it were, you would first up realize that none of these studies would be paradigm shifting anyways. A consensus is built up paper by paper, study after study. That is a limitation of sports science that each study doesn't have a huge sample size and not a huge amount of power, but that's why you can look at multiple studies broadly showing the same thing. And guess what? Most of the effects, as you've mentioned earlier in the video that we study, just aren't that big. The effects of say doing 15 versus 20 sets a week on hypertrophy, probably not that big. And that's why we need studies with decent sample sizes to be able to measure them. And that's why even people with a variety of approaches in the trenches, in the gym, are still getting results in spite of not following the science or having seemingly a wide disparity in their approaches. Now that takes us to the more insidious problem in this field, and that's fraud. Many okay, there's been a few studies of Barbalo. Yep, Barbalo is one of like two instances of fraud that I can think of within sports science. If you're dealing with hundreds and thousands of authors and you can only think of two instances, fraud isn't a rampant issue and certainly not a reason to disregard sports science altogether. There are also accusations of outright fake numbers where compound movements like squats are done to momentary muscular hey, failure. I did that pretty much. It does work. Uh, you can do it. Once again, allow McDonald. No one can squat five sets of eight to 12 to failure, right? It was listed as a rep max load on 90 seconds. It cannot be done. So it's been uh, about a week and I'm still I did the walkout. To, uh, you hear me? Video, I got a thousand bucks too. So, you know, shout out Law McDonald. Thank you for the money. One video, no edits. Prove me wrong, thousand bucks. These protocols can't be done thing. Broadly speaking, they can pretty much all be done. However, if you're reading these papers and you notice that they say participants did sets of eight to 12 rep maxes with 90 seconds rest, that generally, nowadays it's being specified a lot more. For example, in this recent study by Ennis and colleagues that I actually did a session from, you can check that out here. But nowadays it's being specified more, but back in the day, they wouldn't specify that between sets, you would drop the load in order to actually make the sets feasible. Obviously, if you just did a set to failure, you're not going to be able to do the same set again in 90 seconds. If you've read research before, broadly speaking, this isn't news to you. This is something that kind of everyone just knows, except for people who are not really in the field, like potentially Lyle McDonald or Alex Bromley in this case. For instance, the discussion of training effort gets watered down to a simple That's not true. Failure or not to failure, but there's a lot of real estate in there that matters. He has a point. In some older meta-analyses, we treat a lot of variables as if they're binary, right? Like we're either talking about high volume or low volume. And low volume, for example, might mean below 10 sets and high volume, for example, above 10 sets. Or we might talk about failure, aka actually hitting failure or non-failure, anything that is not failure, three ups in reserve, six ups in reserve, everything. That is a limitation of older meta-analyses. And from the looks of things, that's all Bromley's really ever looked at, right? Like the Schoenfeld meta-analysis kind of categorized volumes as opposed to treating it as a continuous variable, where you're not saying, well, there's certain categories that volume falls into that we're defining. It's more of a numerical number, right? Like how does hypertrophy change when we go from five to 10 sets, from 10 to 15, from 15 to 20, and kind of just viewing it as a number rather than something they need to categorize into low, medium, and high. And more recent meta-analyses, like for example, the most recent meta-analysis on training to failure by Robinson and colleagues did exactly this. My range of motion meta-analysis also looked at variables, not dichotomously, wherever possible, but rather as a continuous variable. So just keep in mind that he's mentioning some limitations here, but they're almost entirely applicable to only very old studies and presumably only the ones that he's actually read. So again, only older studies. Back is particularly weak, getting close to failure on a squat is not going to have the same effect on your quads as a leg extension. And let's forget the about- music's The music's very sort of positive all of a sudden. Now there's a spectrum with effort that is important to define. Hit followers go well beyond the point of failure and most volume-based bodybuilders still actually reach momentary- Indeed, and the most recent paper on failure by Robinson colleagues looked at pretty much exactly all this. Finally, there is stopping short of failure at some RIR or reps in reserve. Any coach who works with the average population will tell you that there is a huge Oh man. No, it does not. Oh man. The paper that's most relevant to the topic 
is one I've actually been involved with. I was a co-author on this paper. It actually looked at every study that's previously tried to look at how accurate are people at gauging RPE or reps in reserve. Long story short, people are off by less than one rep in their estimate of how many more reps they could have done on a given set. So people are actually quite accurate. Above 12 reps or so, people start to become less accurate. But on average, we're talking about being off by less than one rep. So claiming now that coaches know in practice, you know, people are wildly inaccurate, I don't think that's necessarily true. There might be a difference between how accurate people are in lab conditions, when they have people looking at them and they have to be honest about their RPE. But ultimately, I think that most people are accurate enough. The big thing here is I wouldn't cite this paper, I would cite the actually most relevant paper. Because the most relevant paper is actually looking at how accurate are people at gauging reps and reserve, versus just what load do people on average do a set with. A similar studies with RPE show. He's portraying a consensus here that simply isn't true. As I just mentioned, the meta-analysis on the topic how says the opposite. Any accuracy of effort in any research that is supposed to compare with the <sighs> So. The answer is we don't. First of all, people are generally reasonably accurate, at least within the context of these studies, right? Like the studies that we have looking at how accurate people are, are done in a lot. The studies that he's referring to now in exercise science where people are supposedly not accurate, that's the same condition. So they are going to be pretty accurate. And here's the real mindfuck. Just because you think you're going to failure and you actually fail a rep, doesn't mean you truly failed. And in fact, no one observing you from the outside could ever really truly tell how close to failure you were. Even if you fail a rep, how do you not know that you just kind of gave it a half-assed effort? You didn't really give it your all. There's a good chance that you didn't, right? Especially if your aim is to go to failure, a lot of people might just slow down their contraction speed as a means to make the set end earlier. So while Alex is saying here, well, all of these studies should have people train to failure because that's the only way we know that they're actually training hard and to failure, the truth is even when participants fail or even when Alex fails in the gym or even when I fail in the gym, we just don't truly know whether he hit failure. We just don't know. So first off, participants are accurate enough at reps in reserve or RPE that it doesn't hugely matter whether we have them trained to failure or not. Generally, we do have them trained to failure just because it increases the stimulus from every given set, right? So if we just wanna see, is there a difference between, for example, four inches of motion and length and partials, making them train to failure just means you see larger effects. But more importantly, even if you think you go to failure, there's no way of knowing if you actually went to failure. We have to accept that we can't speak no, with certainty. No, and we don't speak with certainty. That's something that scientists like probably don't do. Exactly. It's understanding the trade off between incurring a ton of fatigue to get that last failure rep versus staying a rep or two short of failure and maintaining quality over multiple sets actually seems like it would be a productive area of investigation for the field of exercise science. Oh well, exercise This has been something that exercise important. science has looked at quite no in depth. We've looked at the effects of going closer to failure and what effect that has on hypertrophy on a given set. We also have a few studies now looking at the effects of going closer to failure and how that impacts fatigue, at least in unacclimated subjects. One area of research I agree there is more need for research in is looking at is failure still fatiguing once you've actually gotten used to it? AKA, if you've been training to failure for 12 weeks, as opposed to it being your first time, nice. does it still produce more fatigue compared to say keeping one rep in the tank? My hunch is it does, but the effect on fatigue diminishes with time as you get exposed to it more often and more often as the repeated bout effect kicks up. Given how much of a difference can occur with changes in exercise selection and order. Alex Bromley makes these assumptions that I don't know where he pulls them from. I think because this whole video is kind of like a bashing on exercise science and a lot of its flaws, which a lot of the flaws are genuine. I don't disagree with that. But I'm not sure where he gets his information from them because science is ultimately still our best way to get at answers and to essentially measure reality. For example, he claims that exercise order has a large effect on hypertrophy. The most recent meta-analysis on the topic, and we have quite a few studies on the topic, doesn't suggest there is an effect of exercise order on hypertrophy. My most published research is false. So recently, Holy shit, it's very toxic. have attempted to quantify the problem by replicating some prominent past results. The reproducibility project- Yep, a very important project. But found only 36% had a statistically significant result the second time around. And the strength of measured relationships were on Indeed. half those of the original studies. An attempted verification of 53 studies considered landmarks in the basic science of cancer- For what it's worth, it generally seems that sports science is a bit more methodologically rigorous than psychology. It's still not perfect by any means, but it is a little bit better. There would be mass coordination to get the best data, but the real stakes, it turns out, are just not getting published. In this Veritasium video- Shout out Veritasium. Research is 
wrong, Derek Mueller explains how the selection of studies increases the chances of incorrect conclusions being published and how replication studies are actively disincentivized. This is true. Precognition is a classic example of uh, research methods not being very uh, legitimate in the past. Well, surprise, surprise, the hit rate they obtained was not significantly different from chance. When they tried to publish their findings in the same journal as the original paper, they were rejected. The reason? The journal refuses to publish replication studies. There's been a big shift in this recently, by the way. Replication studies are now encouraged by quite a few journals. And uh, though they may not get published as easily as significant findings, generally insignificant findings are becoming a lot more easy to publish and replication studies are being encouraged. All other sports recognize that the human organism acts like an entire That's not true. System. Plenty of other sports have extremely poor practices, so no. Like shit, when I think about some of the boxing or football practices out there, yeah, it's rough by how much fatigue you've accumulated and why some cite gains from going from a volume approach to an intensity approach. But when you have a lifter that's been training with a ton of volume for a long time and you pull that volume back, let them recover a little bit from not, you know, doing these crazy, you know, the Arnold type routines, which they is what all those guys were doing. The adaptation. Yeah. So there absolutely is an amount of volume that is too much for a given lifter, where they actually see worse strength gains and worse muscle growth. However, with strength specifically, what tends to happen a lot, what Alex actually pointed out correctly here, is that when you're training with high volumes, you also generate a lot of fatigue. And so in the short term, while you're training hard with high volumes, you may not see your strength gains right away. But then when you pull back to lower volumes, you're suddenly training with much lower fatigue and thus your strength is able to be expressed. And you see potentially some of the gains that you actually accrued from when you were training with higher volumes. So if you're overtraining or training with more volume rather than you should, because overtraining is a separate thing entirely, but if you're training with more volume than you can recover from and benefit from, yeah, do less. But that doesn't mean that a more intense approach is inherently and categorically better than a higher volume approach. And ultimately, what is high volume is individual. This hypertrophy model can't say anything about complex training splits where a day of work isn't supposed to be singularly responsible for a fixed- This is fair enough, right? A lot of studies do not use a training program that is similar to what people would do in practice. However, when we look at the effect of periodization on hypertrophy, for example, in the most recent meta-analysis, it just doesn't seem to play a large role. So to assume that periodization would somehow change all of the things that we know reasonably well, like higher volumes up to a certain point, seem to lead to more growth. Taking a given set closer to failure also seems to lead to more growth. To say that periodization would somehow invalidate all of these broad findings that we've seen across multiple studies, not in one low power study, but in multiple consistent studies, is just to say nonsense. Mike is That's me! In reality, the question of what percentage of your gains a certain amount of volume can give doesn't make any sense without considering the person. Absolutely. You know, if you're going from an hour in the gym a week to 10 hours in the gym a week, but you're only getting double the growth, maybe that's not worth it to some people returns and then be outpaced by the accumulation of fatigue which will lead to plateau and regression not to be that guy again but i'm gonna cite some more research the concept of overtraining and i think i've made a video about this before if i haven't i'll make one in the future the concept of overtraining is thrown around a lot but at least in the research it doesn't get observed that easily there's not really many studies out there that have seen overtraining and overtraining being defined as a consistent prolonged decrease in performance lasting months as a result of training too much. So while it can absolutely happen and probably happens more in practice than in the research, I don't think it's something you need to be overly concerned about for most people who have a nine to five job and who can only train for say five to 10 hours a week anyways. Do you call that volume optimal because it grew you in the beginning or do you call it suboptimal? Oh man. You stop responding to it? It's not either answer that's silly. It's the question which only allows for silly answers. So that's a hot take, because the most recent review paper we have looking at how does your previous volume impact your growth with different volumes afterwards. So for example, if you start at 10 sets, how does your growth change going from 10 sets to say 15, staying at 10 or going down to five? The evidence we have around that, as summarized in a review paper by Hammerton colleagues, doesn't seem to suggest that there's a huge effect of how much volume you were training with previously and your sort of future progress. So just because you've been training with high volumes, it doesn't mean you're not gonna see good gains in the future. That's a fallacy. And I think it's just something that people who don't like training with high volumes will just say, because they're like, ah, okay, yeah, you get, you get a bit more gains more fast, but then in the long term, you end up at the same place. 
I think that's defeatist and probably inaccurate given the evidence. Around the idea of volume cycling as perhaps being worth considering. Which suggests that volume may not be absolute, it may be... I don't think it is, as much as Lane Norton is brilliant. I think there are some theoretical benefits to possibly... I don't think there is, probably. I think it probably just has to do with average volume. Old move, suggesting that there isn't just a fixed range of training that people should discover and then adhere to forever. Really going out on a limb on that one. This is... On the one hand, Alex is like, oh, scientists, nothing paradigm shifting, and they overemphasize the importance of results, when in reality it's plagued with all these methodological issues. And yet, when scientists actually use nuance in their claims, as he just cited now, he then proceeds to make fun of them. A bit of a double standard. To correlate to substantial long-term muscle growth is progression. It's absolutely key. It's the thing that drives your training forward week to week, and the sign that your training is doing what it's supposed to. So progression technically isn't the thing that drives your program week to week. It's in fact happens as a result of good programming. You don't progress, and that is what's driving your program week to week. It's more so you're doing good training and therefore you grow a bit of muscle, you get a bit stronger, and you're able to progress week to week. It's the other way around, essentially. When stagnation occurs, which it does for everyone, continued progression needs to be addressed. And you do that by adding stress, implementing a different stress, or allowing more recovery. For increasing stress, concentrated periods of high amounts of work that might be unsustainable long-term might also be needed to cause growth in the short term when you've become resistant to that stimulus. This is Lee Haney and Arnold Schwarzenegger talking about their hardest training being the 12 weeks leading into the Olympia because that's when that training was most important and they couldn't sustain that work year round. It's John Meadows talking about how we did short specialization phases to increase work for weak points while keeping everything else at maintenance. It's Tudor Bampa writing about periodization for bodybuilders and serious strength training. It's Mike Isertel using terminology like mesocycles and deloads to talk about hypertrophy training and in the process actually addressing the need for fatigue management and deliberate inclusion of novel stimulus. It seems to me that Alex is a lot more into the idea of speculating based on not too much evidence than on actually relying on the evidence directly. The evidence we have, the scientific evidence we have, tells us a few things. For example, it tells us that doing more volume to a certain point is probably better for growth, at least in a relatively small time frame. Likewise, taking a site closer to failure leads to more growth. Potentially, doing some lengthened partials leads to more growth than doing a full range of motion. It tells us a few things. Alex seems to be more into the idea of using a few small studies to make broad inferences about long-term periodization. I'm not opposed to periodization, but it's just worth addressing that the evidence on the topic doesn't really support its huge role in progress. I think fundamentally, Alex Bromley comes at it from a very different epistemic perspective, where he doesn't really regard science as being the best way to arrive at the answer, or at the very least, the iteration of sports science that we currently have. Which is fine, it just means that I don't think we would see eye to eye on most topics. The short answer is to throw optimal out the fucking window. We can hypothesize that a thing called optimal exists, but the resolution given in the research doesn't come close to finding that for you or telling you how to find it yourself. Oh man. Collecting data points all over your body, giving real time data to a supercomputer that aggregates it against every other lifter in the world might be able to tell you something specific about what you should do next. Claiming that science isn't going to bring you any closer to an optimal approach versus a non-optimal approach, I think is defeatist. Ultimately, I think science is a much better tool to get us closer to optimal than is just looking around you at a number of anecdotes and seeing what seems to connect them all. Is there a number of anecdotes that seem to align in some way? Like they're all doing the same thing and they're all getting better results. The issue there is you have even less control than you do within studies. By controlling for some factors like nutrition, like sometimes even performing within subject designs, where they're training one leg with a full range of motion and one leg with a partial range of motion, we're able to have much greater accuracy of does one thing actually work better than another if you're dealing with the same person or if genetics are equated for on average, that sort of stuff. He even spelled temperament. Very cool. That's right. If you talk to anyone in their 40s or above who's been lifting since their teenage years, which isn't hard to find, 
Virtually all of them, amateur to elite, have gone through long periods of no progress, punctuated by short periods of quick progress. That means that statistically, anyone blocked the no, training not really. was more likely to have done nothing at all than not to have really, actually no. made it better. Most people gradually grow slowly and slowly as you get more advanced. It's not this random. You progress a lot, they don't progress. Unless you start taking KDs, for example. Is the difference between doing something or nothing between now and your next training block? So, with respect to what you do in the gym between this week and next, your optimal path is not best out of the field of all possibilities. Optimal is just there is an optimal path, though. And it turns out that there are a lot of ways to get the body to do something. And absolutely none of it has there is anything absolutely to do with the number of PubMed articles that you've read. Oh man. So that's all I got for today, guys. I know many of you might be disillusioned to hear my severe take on the state of exercise science. I'm not particularly disillusioned, I have to say. I think that Alex Bromley ultimately is overly skeptical of science. I think that he's throwing out sports science altogether because of some of his limitations, some of which he understands correctly and some of which he doesn't. I'm gonna give this video a solid three or four out of 10 because some of the concerns raised are genuine, right? Like small sample sizes within a study are genuine. The generalizability of a given study to your own circumstances can be questionable depending on the study. But ultimately, a lot of these issues don't mean, even if you take them all together in their totality, that doesn't mean that you just throw out sports science altogether. Sports science still remains our best tool to arrive at the truth to measure does this thing have an effect or not because if all you're relying on is real world examples you will have too much noise to be able to tell anything guys that's the video if you enjoyed the video please like comment subscribe and i'll see you guys my subscribers in that next one peace